Welcome to a new wave of entrepreneurship. I'm Latifa Farah, Associate Creative Producer at Venture for Canada and the producer of a new wave of entrepreneurship. The focus of this podcast is to hear from changemakers and Canadian entrepreneurs to learn about how they've developed their entrepreneur mindset and skills. In season five, we'll be chatting with CEOs, founders, and successful business leaders about their career journeys. We're excited to dive into these conversations about how to foster your entrepreneurial mindset and drive. Gork Ning is the Wall Street Journal bestselling author of The Unspoken Rules, Secrets to Starting Your Career Off Right, a book published by Harvard Business Review Press. It is a guide to help early career professionals, especially those from underrepresented backgrounds, navigate the school to work transition and ascend to positions of leadership based on 500 plus interviews with professionals across geographies, industries, and job types. He has been featured in the Today Show, the New York Times, the Wall Street Journal, BuzzFeed, the New York Post, Fast Company, and CNBC. Gork, a first-generation college student, is a graduate of Harvard College and Harvard Business School. Gork, uh, it's been a pleasure uh, getting to know you over the last uh, couple of years. And, and just to say your book is, is fantastic uh, and I've really enjoyed reading it. And it's a tremendous resource for students. Thanks so much for joining us. How are you doing this morning? <laughs> Thanks so much for having me, Scott. I'm doing great. It's great to be reunited with you. I feel like as I flash back to the book writing process, we spent so much time together on a Google Doc communicating through track changes. So this this book has your fingerprints all over it. Well, I, I appreciate the, the the small kind of contributions that I that I made, and and uh, really credit to you and and the many other people who uh, who contributed to it. Uh, it, it is a tr- fantastic uh, resource. And uh, I was just saying in the pre-show, we're really excited to be gifting your book to different venture for Canada fellows as they get hired at, at startups because it's such a fantastic resource in general. For, I think for really everybody, but it, in particular when someone's first starting their career, it it is very action oriented and gives a ton of tips on how somebody can start their career off, off right. So on the topic of, of this book, Gore, can you tell us a little bit about your, your personal background and how did your personal story motivate you to, to write this book? Sure thing. So I was born and raised in Toronto or Toronto, depending on the audience, if it's a US audience or a, a Canadian audience. I'm the proud son of a working class single mother. My mom left school when she was 12 years old. And I had the privilege of attending Harvard for undergrad. And that transition from home to to university was a big eye-opening experience where I started realizing that there were so many of my peers and friends, classmates who had had this informal education growing up. They had siblings, they had parents, they had mentors who were able to guide them through not only just school and how to apply to a, a university, but as I went along, how to apply for a job, and then more importantly, how to succeed once you're in a job. So I started realizing that, wow, there's this informal education that's delivered over the dinner table that I didn't end up having, but that I could pass down to someone else, someone who may not have had those siblings, those parents, and those mentors growing up. So it was really a a self-reflection on my part of, wow, I've accumulated so much privilege in a short period of time, what responsibility do I have to hopefully pave a smoother path for those coming after me? Your book is so important. And, and I think it's important for everybody, but as you mentioned, particularly important for, for young people who uh, are underrepresented uh, in, um, in various uh, sectors of, of, of the economy. Uh, and I've reflected, uh, in reading your book, I reflected a little bit on my own upbringing, which was quite privileged. I attended private school. I had a lot access to a lot of different opportunities. And how there was a lot of, of these unspoken rules that, that I sometimes just gained through osmosis of the privilege of my family background, everything from golf, starting to golf when you're like, you know, eight uh, and learning, you know, the, which in, well, I'd say golf is, is less prevalent amongst young people, but it's still in certain sectors, quite important for, for, uh, for business and various other things that were just kind of little, uh, yeah, I'd say unspoken rules that, that people kind of gain over time. And then when I went to university, uh, I saw, saw for the first time and kind of left this bubble of private school. And I'll, although I would say, I'll still say Georgetown was not the most uh, diverse of, of uh, environments either. But I, when I met sort of first generation um, college students at, at Georgetown, I saw that, that there was this, you know, it was this kind of culture shock, I think, for a lot of, uh, of young people uh, who they maybe went from like a, you know, a, a public school in South Texas, and then all of a sudden they're in Washington, D.C., 
And there's a whole different set of the of, uh, beyond workplace of just social rules and these kind of hidden social rules that 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 uh, that existed. Out of interest, sort of beyond the unspoken rules of the workplace, what was what did you find your transition kind of going from from you know Toronto uh, in a you know first generation as a first generation college student to to Harvard College? What was, what was that transition uh, like? Yeah, it was a it was an eye opening experience. I I'm I'm trying to deconstruct what is. American culture versus Canadian culture and what is Harvard culture versus non-Harvard culture. And I think the two can often, uh, it, it's all blurred in my head. One of the things that I, I discovered even before I showed up to, to Harvard was Americans seem to have this propensity to want to rank everything. And you see this with colleges, you see this with pretty much everything. It just, America's full of listicles. Uh, and I think that leads to a certain achievement, externally validation oriented culture that I don't think I experienced growing up. Although, you know, I might be comparing apples to oranges because I was in the US versus Canada at very different stages of life. But actually, maybe to toss this back to you, because you had a similar experience. Am I crazy for, for feeling like lists are all over the place as it relates to the US? I do think that, uh, and for listeners, I, I loved, I've lived in Canada and, and the US. Um, and what I would say is that in general, the, uh, the United States has a more individualistic culture and a culture that embraces uh, competition more, which, which results. Uh, so I do think you're, as a corollary, I do think your, your thesis that Americans like ranking things more. And, and as, as, a, as a kind of a, so, a sociological example is in the US, you see bumper stickers with uh, where people went to college all the time, like on, on cars. In Canada, it's actually quite rare to see people put their alma mater bumper sticker on a car. You see it sometimes, but it's very rare. I, so I, I think that that also, I share this as an example too, is I think that in the United States, because of the, the, the more intense sort of, in some ways, neoliberalism is much stronger in the US. And I would say that, although it still exists in Canada, that, that kind of c- competitive nature, people also attach their identity more strongly to specific kind of like institutions. Then I think in Canada, that certainly exists, but there's not, um, uh, and it, it goes beyond post-secondary institution. It's the same, I would even argue with employers and uh, other kinds of affiliations that, that people people don't tie those as strong to their kind of personal identity. I, I, my hypothesis in Canada, does that, does that resonate with you? Oh Gord? yeah, 100%, 100%. And uh, when I was growing up and watching, watching TV, certainly there's a lot of American TV shows that make their way across the border cartoons, uh, live action, whatever. There's this concept of homecoming that I, I'm still trying to wrap my head around after, <laughs> despite having been here for a while, where, yeah, there's this affiliation that it, it's almost like you're collecting, you're collecting stamps on a passport and one stamp leads to this social event, that stamp leads to this bumper sticker, this other stamp leads to this social circle. So the, the, the stratification, the artificial stratification that arises from one's lived experience that is otherwise relatively arbitrary, people attach a great deal of association and value to it. Absolutely. And there's a lot of research on signaling and kind of post-secondary institutions, but I would also argue that it uh, applies a lot to, to employers. I uh, I remember very like when I went to work at Goldman Sachs and, and I haven't worked there for like eight years, but I'll still have people be like, oh, you worked at like Goldman Sachs uh, uh, and just ask me all these questions. And I was like, A, that was eight years ago. B, that was for like less than a year. <laughs> uh, and uh, just because I, I work there doesn't, you know, uh, it's not my my like like identity, but it is it is funny how, uh, you know, I think certain employers or academic institutions have huge uh, kind of like signaling power. I also, I think in both Canadian and, and American society, but also kind of around the world. So kind of shifting gears a little bit to, to your book, uh, can you at first, one of the things that I, I really love uh, is your uh, delineation of the three C's. Uh, and can you describe to our listeners, what are the three C's and why do they, they matter? Sure thing. So the North Star for my book is a framework, as you said, called the three C's, which stand for competence, commitment, and compatibility. And you can imagine these three C's as existing inside of a Venn diagram. 
where there's an intersection between the three circles. And the idea is the minute you show up as a professional, and frankly, I've heard actually that this is just as relevant for dating, um, have not written a book or pressure tested this in a different realm, but the minute you show up, whether it's in a cover letter, in a resume, in a coffee chat, in an interview, and when you're in the workplace, interacting with clients, coworkers, partners, the people around you are sizing you up and they're asking themselves three questions. Question one is, can you do this job well? Which is the question of, are you competent? Question two is, are you excited to be here? Which is the question of, are you committed? And question three is, do we get along? Which is the question of, are we compatible? So are you competent? Are you committed? Are you compatible? The three C's. Your job, and frankly, all of our jobs, including the CEO at the very top, it's our collective challenge to convince other people that we are in fact competent, committed, and compatible. You'll need to prove that you're competent for people to trust you with responsibilities and more important responsibilities. You need to prove that you are committed for people to want to invest in your career. And then you need to flex your compatibility for others to want to work with you. So I see that as the North Star for every social setting, whether it's in emails, phone calls, one-on-ones, feedback sessions, all day, every day. By the way, you could one day do like a series of unspoken rules. You could do unspoken rules for dating, unspoken rules for uh, lots of different, because I, I, I say it you know, partly jokingly, but I do think that there's unspoken rules that exist in like all aspects of our, our society in, in so many different ways. And uh, the, the, the workforce is definitely a big part, but it's, it's much for dating. And we actually had on another episode of the Venture for Canada podcast, we interviewed uh, the founder of Snack App, which is like one of the top 10 most downloaded dating apps in the US right now. Uh, and she's from Vancouver. Uh, and uh, anyway, we, ha- we talk a lot about uh, the unspoken rules of, of dating, although we don't necessarily uh, kind of uh, call it that. So kind of in terms of, and by the way, I love that that framework, because I, I also think that it's, it, it relates a lot to, to uh, a lot of the times, for instance, like technical expertise, if someone is a, a brilliant software engineer, but they're a big jerk and they're difficult to deal with, uh, it doesn't mean that they're, nece- they're not going to rise up in, in the company. And I think that sometimes people think, oh, I can just be this brilliant person and then just be a big jerk to like a sort of the Steve Jobs. Uh, but the reality is in, in the real world, that doesn't necessarily uh, fly uh, most of the time. So your, your sort of Venn diagram uh, breaking down the, the three C's is, is fantastic. Another thing that I really enjoyed in your book is you talk a little bit about the distinction between an internal and external narrative uh, and the importance of both. For our listeners, can, can you define those terms? Yeah, the, an external narrative is what you say, how you answer the question of tell me about yourself or what got you interested in this job or why this company? These are inevitable questions that we all get on our first day in a new job when we're in an interview, when we're in a coffee chat, your external narrative is the story you tell to convince others that you are in fact competent, committed, and compatible whenever you're asked those questions. Your internal narrative is what you tell yourself in the morning when you get out of bed and it's why you hustle at work and why you hustle every day. So you might, for example, be taking on this job because you want to learn a certain set of skills. You want to meet a certain set of people. You want to build a certain set of bullet points on your resume. You might want to have a certain signal on that, on that resume. These are the real and honest reasons why we do what we do. However, when we're in an interview setting, some of that is information that we want to share. Some of that is maybe information that's less convenient to share. So I'll, when I'm coaching students, Sometimes, and when I talk to recruiters, for example, they'll tell me about times when they'll ask a job candidate, hey, why are you interested in this position? And then the job candidate will say something like, oh, well, it's because it pays well. And yes, that's probably the reason why the recruiter's there as well. (laughs) That's the internal narrative. But there's also an external narrative of what got you excited about this position. Is it because you're interested in the stories that this media company tells? or the, the type of culture that this organization has been able to build, that they're able to do well and do good? Or is it about a certain product or service that you yourself use that gets you excited? So that's really the external narrative and it overlaps with the internal narrative, but it's important to differentiate those two because we're always dancing between why do we do what we do and what are we gonna tell others? 
And I, in an ideal world, I'll say those Venn diagrams, if I think about our journeys as professionals, it's really the journey of trying to find an internal narrative that matches your external narrative, or rather the other way around, finding that external narrative that fits your internal narrative. So when you're starting off in your career, you might feel like the two don't overlap and that's okay. That's where a lot of us start off. But over the course of discovering yourself and what you're good at, what you're passionate about, those Venn diagrams will increasingly overset, inter, uh, <laughs> will increasingly overlap. What advice do you have for a young person and to really figure out what their passion is? Recognizing like most people, uh, particularly when they're starting their career, have no idea what their passion is. You just have to see it to believe it. You can take as many career assessments online. You can have as many conversations and coffee chats as you have time for, but in the end, your body is going to send a message. In the end, your body will tell you whether you're excited about something or not. And I, I often find myself using the, the caffeine test, if I were to coin a term here, where I have found myself in situations before where it didn't matter how little sleep I got the prior night. I had so much energy the next day just because I was looking forward to whatever it was that I was about to do. On the other hand, there have also been situations where it didn't matter how much sleep I got the prior night. Maybe I got a full night's rest. Maybe I just came back from vacation. Maybe I'm super recharged or I should have been recharged. But then the minute I encounter the situation, this project, these people, maybe it just drains every last bit of energy out of me. Coffee wouldn't have helped in that situation. I think that was my body telling me that, Hey, there's something here that you're not recognizing around what you like and what you don't like. Listening to one's body. I, I think is something that's so it's important in the context of this conversation, but also just in general, I think that sometimes we can get disconnected to, uh, to what our bodies are kind of telling us. And, uh, I think it's a really important message. So let's say that you have a young person and they're in a job and they hate it. And they realize that their body is telling them quit leave this job. Uh, and uh, there's lots of writing right now about called the great resignation, uh, which, uh, you know, where millions of people are leaving their jobs as the pandemic uh, wanes. What advice do you have on how a person can leave their job without burning a ton of bridges? Well, if, if I can answer a question you didn't ask, but I think is really important in the situation is when you find yourself thinking it's time to leave, it's helpful to ask yourself, what am I running away from? And what am I running towards? So what are you running away from? Is it the people? Is it the position? Is it the place? So is it something about your coworkers, your managers, the type of people that you're working with, your clients that is draining your energy? Is it about the position? Is it about what you do day to day? Is it how well you're compensated, the benefits? Or is it about the place around is it the culture of this organization? Is it the way that the leaders lead the organization? Is it the direction this organization is headed in? So knowing what you're running away from is really important because you might feel like the grass is greener on the other side, only to realize that you just stepped on the same patch of grass or that the grass was greenest where you started off. And then when it comes to where you're running towards, it's important to know, okay, now that I've isolated the variable that I'm trying to change in my life to make sure that this is actually a variable that will exist in the next job that you're going to. So for example, if what is not giving you a lot of energy is data crunching, well, if you're moving to another organization only to do a lot of number crunching again, you won't have solved that problem. So Forgive me for taking this slight detour, but I think it is really important to, to think about, to, to be your own doctor and to diagnose the root cause of why you might not be feeling as energized as you would have liked. Once you have decided that, hey, this is the path that I'm going to go down, it's time to leave the organization, then it's important to do a couple of things. So one is to make sure that you're giving your manager as much advance notice as possible and to help smooth the transition. So the reality is all of us are going to move around. That includes your supervisor, how willing you are and how much effort you put in to making others life easy 
will determine a great deal how others view you and the reputation that you leave behind. So rather than, you know, there's a lot of guidance out there around, oh, give two weeks, give four weeks. I think all of that's an arbitrary number. Ask yourself, how can I set my team up so that this isn't a rocky transition? So does it require, does the fact that your job is super unique and highly skilled or uniquely skilled, does that mean that you have to give six months advance notice, three months advance notice? Does it mean that you could do more to maybe find your successor or develop an onboarding guide or maybe even stay for a certain number of weeks to transition to this other person? That all can do wonders for your reputation, really, that will last your entire life. The next thing to think about is how to show your gratitude and to maintain those connections. So send an email to the entire team, the entire department, the entire organization, depending on the culture of the organization, thanking everyone, shouting out the relevant shout outs, and then send one-on-one -on -one emails to people that you've interacted with, learned from, worked with, and then offer to stay in touch, share your email, add them on LinkedIn. Ultimately your job may be temporary, but the relationships you build and the reputation you leave behind can and will last a lifetime. And unfortunately, I, I have definitely seen a lot of people, I think in particular at the beginning of their career, sometimes burn bridges. Uh, I, I've seen and heard situations where people just quit and, uh, and then just don't show up uh, and, or they quit via email. Uh, I've seen so many horror stories or where people have resigned and then they're still working at the company, but then they, and this is more uh, existing in this virtual world but then they'll secretly also be overlapping a little bit with their, their new job. And then the other employer finds out and it's like, wait, why, why, uh, uh, why this, this person's doing two jobs uh, virtually. So all this is to say is don't do that. Follow Gorik's advice. And uh, just because you're leaving a job doesn't mean you want to just burn all the social capital that you have. Because who knows, you could be working with those people. They could be clients. Uh, and uh, you want to maintain the relationships that you spent a lot of time and, and effort uh, building. Uh, Gork, you have heard, I'm sure, so much different kind of career advice uh, from, uh, you know, just di like uh, that different people you talk to or and then you've read so many different books on kind of this field. What is a really common piece of career advice that you really disagree with and why? A, a common piece of career advice that I, I hear all the time is it's not su worth submitting a cover letter if the cover letter is optional. And it's not about the cover letter, it's about what's optional in life and what's not optional in life. And in, in my humble opinion, there is no such thing as optional or not optional. If we think about the three Cs, competence, commitment, and compatibility, if you're applying to a job, you need to show all three C's all the time. If you are the hiring manager and you have 200 resumes to look through, what proxies will you use to discern whether someone's committed to this role? If I were on the other side, I could imagine myself, let's say it's midnight. Let's say I have to pick a candidate by 8 a.m. tomorrow. I haven't had much sleep. I would like some more sleep tonight. What am I going to do? there's probably a high likelihood that I'll just cut out the people who didn't feel who didn't come across as if they customized the application at all. So what would you do? Maybe cut out the 80% who didn't submit a cover letter and then skim the rest of the cover letters and see if anyone put even an ounce of effort into, for example, putting my name on at the top of the cover letter. Again, unfair. Who knows if this is happening behind the scenes, but the fact that it could happen behind the scenes leads to me feeling like when it comes to applying for a job, don't think about what is optional or not optional as it is written on the website. Think about the person behind the scenes and how they will size up your competence, your compatibility, and especially your commitment. What advice do you have for young people in terms of how to kind of overcome some their perfectionism? Uh, and, and what challenges do you think perfectionism can present when somebody is applying for, for jobs? There are going to be jobs for which you want to be perfect. And maybe it's the three or five jobs that are at the perfect intersection of what you want and where you're going to have the highest odds. 
in which case, yes, it probably makes sense to double down on customizing that email, making sure that you're as strong a candidate as you can. But for the bottom 95%, that's where you merely need to be good enough. And so what does it look like to be good enough in a job application? This is also advice that you often hear online of, you know, you need to customize your resume. I, I don't quite believe in that. I think that if your resume bullet points are strong, strong as defined by you have uh, strong verbs, strong nouns, and strong numbers, you can send in the same resume basically at most places. Uh, I actually don't know how you would quite customize things with the exception of maybe tweaking a word or, or, or two here and there. Where you will often end up spending more time is on that cover letter or that outreach email. And for that, I would take the Mad Lib approach. So Mad Libs is a fill in the blank exercise that many of us might be familiar with from elementary school, where you have a big paragraph and it's just a bunch of fill in the blanks. So in the case of my cover letter uh, back in the day, I'm going to recall from my distant memory here, but my name is Gork Ng and I am a third year student studying blank at blank. I'm interested in applying for the data science position at blank. I became interested in this opportunity after having spoken with blank, 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 and having read about you in blank. So that's just the first paragraph, for example. But in those blanks, you have the general structure of what you want to write. And all you need to do is just go into your computer and control F or command F and replace the name of the company and the job title. So that first template might take you a couple hours to write, but every subsequent submission should only take you three, five minutes to customize. And a, a, a little trick here is in that, in those further down paragraphs, you don't need to actually customize every sentence. Just drop the name of the company, drop the name of the role, or drop a detail into that paragraph and treat it as a Mad Lib so that no matter what you put in, that paragraph will still make sense. That'll cut down your time from having to spend three hours on something to just spending three minutes on something. An excellent tool for if someone is struggling with perfectionism on how to, to create like a system to make the cover letter process. I think when I was a student and applying to jobs, I often found cover letters really intimidating and would spend like four hours on a cover letter. Uh, and uh, it was set, would sometimes uh, prevent me from even applying to a job because, oh, I don't wanna spend this much time on the cover letter. So think about ways that you can kind of optimize the process and create a system, as, as Gorg said, uh, to uh, be able to do cover letters efficiently uh, and which allows you at the end to, to apply to, to more jobs. Gork, this has been a true pleasure. We have touched a really wide range of topics from how to manage your manager to when to send an email versus setting uh, up a meeting uh, to uh, the three C's, uh, really wide range of different uh, topics. I encourage our listeners to check out Gork. Uh, you can Google him. Uh, he has a great uh, website uh, and also to check out and uh, purchase his book. Uh, the Unspoken Rules, uh, it's available on all different uh, book buying uh, platforms, is a really fantastic resource. This podcast is, is predominantly geared towards recent grads, but I also think his book is really of interest uh, and utility to anyone at any point in their career. So really highly recommend that you check out uh, Gorik's uh, wonderful book. Gorik, thanks so much for coming on the podcast today. That's it for this week's episode of A New Wave of Entrepreneurship. Stay connected with us via our social and our email list. Subscribe to us in your favorite podcast app so that you don't miss our next episode. If you have feedback on today's episode, tweet us at venture for canada that is Venture, the number four, Canada, or email us at podcast at Venture4, that's spelled F-O-R, Canada.ca. We'd love to hear from you. Thanks for listening. I'm Scott Sturt, and until next time, stay safe, stay motivated, and stay grateful. A New Wave of Entrepreneurship is produced by Winita Lee Garcia and Latifa Farah. Editing and mixing also done by Latifa Farah. Erica Ormanston is our editorial assistant. Mark Wallach and Premium Beat own the copyright and publishing rights related to the song used in this podcast. 
The comments and opinions, recommendations, or suggestions expressed on the podcast by the guests are not liable to Venture for Canada and belong solely to each individual. Any information provided stated by our guests and our host is independent of Venture for Canada. A new wave of entrepreneurship is a Venture for Canada brand and all content is owned by Venture for Canada. If you'd like to use our content, please reach out to us at podcast at venture4, that's spelled F-O-R, Canada.ca.